with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covered with you when you came out of Egypt. And my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. I like to think that God made that covenant with me. I came out of Egypt too. He said, my spirit will remain with you. Do not fear. And you know that spirit can do wondrous things. It can turn a desert into a paradise. And because that Spirit can do so much, this week no doubt will be filled with inspiration for many of us. And certainly it should grip us with a certain amount of enthusiasm. You know the primary response to the grace of God and the gift of that Spirit is not duty. It's a joyful trust in what God has done for us. What He's doing for us. And what He will do for us. Amen. It's a pleasure to be a son of God. Amen. So to this congregation, to all the ones that have contributed to this tent refreshing waters, you make our joy easier. And we want to thank you. And God bless you for this opportunity to be with you once again. Amen. Now I suppose as joyful as this week can be for many of us, and as inspirational as it will be for many of us, I don't suppose it's compulsory that everybody has to be here to understand the value of the Holy Spirit. You know, in some ways, the Bible is eminently a poor man's book some ways. Things that will be revealed this week are hidden from the wise, but they're revealed in the babies. I sometimes think I have the mind of a child. And some scriptures just reach out and comfort me dearly. They're simple. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. I will send the Comforter unto you. My Father, my Redeemer, and my sanctifying Holy Spirit, they're equally indispensable unto me. I believe and I trust in that much. I know I was baptized into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now I don't expect to fathom the depth of the Godhead. But with all my heart I believe there are three that bear witness in heaven. Amen. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And I believe those three are one. And I'd rather believe it than understand it. And I had rather proclaim it than know the depth of it. But I do believe several other things about myself that I might as well share with you. I was a sinner, and I come short of the glory of God. But I'm confident that I was justified freely by God's grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, Amen. whom God set forth to be a perpetuation for my sins and the sins of the world, through faith in His blood. And I believe even that was in order that God could establish and show His righteousness. Amen. That He was righteous when He justified me. Amen. Amazing. The mystery of godliness. How blessed and divine that salvation is to me. Another offered an atoning sacrifice. Another imparted his righteousness to all that would believe. The claims of the law on me have been satisfied. A victim of infinite worth satisfied them. Emmanuel 
God with us, died for me. The just for the unjust, that he might bring me to God. And now God is in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. Not counting my trespasses against me. Oh, what an example of love. Unexampled love. The Son incarnate, crucified, risen, glorified, and now interceding. Here at last, mercy and truth got together. Amen. Here at last, righteousness and peace embraced and kissed each other only at the cross. Yet Jesus says, now no one can come unto me except the Father draw him. But again, no one cometh unto the Father but by Jesus. It's like a circle. Oh yes, a circle of light and a circle of love. And I'll go round about Wondering, now how shall I enter that? And Jesus speaks to me and says, I will send the Holy Spirit and he will lead you into all truth. He shall testify of me and guide you in all truth. And that which is born of spirit is spirit. The Holy Spirit will show us Jesus. The Holy Spirit is that power of entrance. Thus our newly created self with the new mind that is given and the new heart that is given made alive by that Holy Spirit is wafted to the footstool of the heavenlies where it's living and loving and thriving in joyful bliss. And all of our affections gush forth from a well of water, springing up into everlasting life. So here, where we are, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is just not some abstract doctrine, but is part and parcel of our spiritual life, our spiritual selves. The Father and that Son have come unto us in the communion of that Spirit and made their abode with us and dwelling in love, we dwell in God. For God is love. Amen. Now, the focus on this tenth refreshing waters is to focus on the Holy Spirit and His work. My topic was to discuss with you the Holy Spirit is a person. And I would pray to God that I don't infringe upon you other speakers' material. Of necessity, I will use many of your scriptures. <laughs> but I pledge to you, I want to stick with my theme. To do so, let me expound on these three statements. The Holy Spirit, while one with God, is to be distinguished from the Father and the Son. Number two, this distinguished entity is a person. And number three, moreover than just a person, he is God. Now for the first proposition, the Holy Spirit is distinguished from the Father and the Son. Lots of times in Scripture, in a context, a simultaneous cooperation between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we need to distinguish the Holy Spirit from the Father as the Father is distinguished from the Holy Spirit. In fact, you need to do that as energetically as you would distinguish the Father from the Son. So we read many of these contexts. I'll just give you about five quickly. Of course, one of the favorite for most people is our Savior's baptism, in which we have the voice of the Father, the human body of our, the presence of Jesus of Nazareth, and the visible descent 
of the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove. The heaven was open and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily shape like a dove upon Jesus and a voice came from heaven which said thou art my beloved son in thee I am well pleased and in that statement alone I am compelled to say that that descending spirit is distinct from the baptized Jesus as distinct as it is from the approving father John 14 Jesus says I will pray the father and he will give you another comforter and that comforter may abide with you forever now this promise of course was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost and one observes the Holy Spirit appeared seated on the disciples as cloven tongues of fire I'm constrained to acknowledge at least to myself that the Holy Spirit is distinct from the mediating praying Savior as well as from the Father who sent the gift. Then we read in a single passage the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And again we read the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. I am personally compelled to believe the necessary distinction that is therein affirmed just by the statement. Now, Peter described saints this way, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctification of the Spirit, unto the obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Christ. There, I conclude that the bleeding Savior is distinct from the predestinating Father, so the sanctifying Spirit is distinct from them both. So can we ask ourselves this question of these five examples, and there are lots of others. Was this cooperating spirit identical with the Father or the Son? If the answer is yes, if he was identical, then the scriptural language leaves me a little bit confused. But here I uh, insist that the Holy Spirit is a distinction from the Father and the Son. And I keep using the word cooperation. You see, they don't have separate operations. They always cooperate. And they cooperate so beautifully, some people get the impression that there are not three. The second proposition in the consideration of this distinguished entity, Scripture ascribes to this Holy Spirit personhood with an independent and intelligent personality. Now, certainly, we acknowledge that biblical language is capable of metaphors or otherwise beautiful figures of speech, a variety of figures of speech. They often capture a spirit of the matter by the use of metaphorical language. So it is with the spirit that often the terms spirit and Holy Spirit do not denote a person, but the gifts of that spirit, the operations of that spirit, or the guidance of that spirit. Thus, the Holy Spirit being poured out or given in greater or less degree are examples of that language. But the question is, is not whether those statements disprove personality or personhood, but are there many other passages which positively and unanswerably establish individual personality. So it's not difficult to grant that by the Spirit are sometimes intended the gifts and the graces of that Spirit. Those graces may be poured out and the gifts distributed, but all these worketh that one and self-same Spirit dividing to every man severally as he wills. Amen. One might ask, well, now, what evidence do we need for personhood? 
What attributes will evidence a personal existence? Well, I think we could all be quite content maybe with this answer. Show me some, something that has a mind, that has an affection, that has a will, that can act, that can speak, that can direct, and that in that acting, loving, determining, speaking, and ruling, he must possess personality or personhood, or it may not exist. So, let's go to Scripture and see what Scripture says about the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 27. He that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. Hey, because he maketh intercession. But that's someone else's sermon. He has a mind. 1 Corinthians 2 and 11. The things of God knoweth no one but the Spirit of God. The things of God knoweth no one but the Spirit of God. Ergo, the Spirit not only has a mind, he has an infinite comprehension with that mind. John 16, 13. The Holy Spirit will show you things to come. The Holy Spirit has foreknowledge. I beseech you for the love of the Spirit to pray for me. The Holy Spirit loves. One might object that this is not referring to the love of the, the ability for the Holy Spirit to love, but that we should love the Holy Spirit. But I differ, or there's plenty of other places. I beseech you for the love of the Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit loves. This denotes personhood. An emanation or an influence doesn't love. The Holy Spirit does. Dividing to every man severally as he wills. Ergo, the Holy Spirit has a self-determining will. Job even early had an insight. He said, the Spirit of God hath made me and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. And he was right. Now we know, of course, the gospel brings a lot more understanding to life and immortality. But at least Job... He had that part right. Psalmist David had inside here. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of heaven by the breath or spirit of his mouth. Ergo, the Holy Spirit creates and gives life. Genesis 6-3, My spirit shall not always strive with man. The spirit strives with the ungodly. John 16, he convicts and convinces of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. John 3, we are born of the Spirit. Not only did the Spirit give Adamic life, he gives the new created life for the new creation. The book of Acts, the Spirit said to Philip, go near. The Spirit made me go with them. The Holy Spirit said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul. Being forbid of the Holy Spirit to preach. The Holy Spirit suffered them not. So the Holy Spirit commands and forbids. Acts, the flock over which the Holy Spirit made you overseers, appoints ministers to the church. Holy men spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit inspired sacred writers. In the latter times, the Spirit speaks expressively or clearly. He said to the churches, and he gave them the message of the Son of Man. The Spirit took me up. The Spirit lifted me up. The Spirit gave them utterance. The Spirit caught away Philip. Mighty signs and wonders were done by the power of the Spirit. Ergo, the Spirit performed miracles. The whole context of 1 Corinthians 12 shows that the Holy Spirit works in all saints, dispensing diverse gifts, but always with independent spontaneity of choice. Titus 3 and Ephesians 4, the Spirit regenerates. I love that. We needed that. And seals His people. We're saved by His renewing, sealed unto the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit. 
Romans 8, the Holy Spirit helpeth our infirmities and maketh intercession for us. I just get amazed at thinking that a puff of smoke made me making an intercession for me. I wouldn't put much faith in that. He teaches, he comforts, and he guides into all truth, John 14. Ephesians, they returned and vexed his spirit. Grieve not the spirit. We are witnesses of these things. So is the spirit. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit. Thanks. The spirit approves, judges. The spirit and the bride say, come, or go he invites. It is expedient, Jesus says, that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. In the very personal sense that Jesus is gone is the personal sense that the Spirit has come. Amen. He can be personally blasphemed as could Jesus. Who speaketh a word against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him. He cries in our hearts, Abba Father, and even causes us to cry, Abba Father. He repeats the beatitude pronounced on those who sleep in Jesus. Yea, said the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors. On and on we could go. But surely... If one calmly but comprehensively studies the testimonies that we have read, he concludes that if these qualities and actions do not prove personality and personhood, really there's none that would. And so to those that speak of the Spirit as an effusion or an emanation or even just an influence or even a power from God, I ask you, can... An emanation or an effusion or even a power reveal the future, love, possess the power, have a will on his own, create, strive, convince, recreate, enjoin, prohibit, commission, inspire, speaks expressively, addresses the church, performs miracles, gives utterance, energizes, regenerates, seals, intercedes, teaches, comforts, guides, is vexed, is grieved, testifies, approves, invites, is personally present, is Jesus is personally absent, who can be blasphemed, crying in us until we shout out a Father. Is this not? A person? Possibly, in a few instances, one could use metaphorical language and personify an influence. But if these taken collectively do not mean person and personality, then I'm again confused. But moreover, language is confused. And the basic principle of truth has been deranged. But honest language, though fully capable of metaphors and figures of speech, is not the case here. It would be very delusive to us. The witness of Scripture is unequivocal that the Holy Spirit is a living being working with a conscience, a will, and a volition. In short, he is a person. But Thirdly, he is no ordinary person. He is no less than deity, no less than God. He is eternal. Hebrews 9, 14, Christ through the eternal spirit offered himself. He is omnipresent. Whether shall I go from thy spirit? Whether shall I flee from thy presence? Psalms 139, he is omniscient. He is, he with the infinite son comprehends the incomprehensible Jehovah. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 and 11. The spirit searcheth all things, even the deep things of God. The things of God knoweth no one but the spirit of God. 
He is prescient. He unveils the future. It was revealed unto Simeon by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Christ. He will show you things to come. He is totally free and independent. The wind bloweth where it listeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit, dividing as he willeth. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. He, of course, is infinitely good and holy. Thou gavest thy good spirit to instruct them. The Spirit is good, Psalms 143. He is repeatedly styled in the Old Testament scriptures the Holy Spirit of God. He is consistently styled by our Savior the Holy Spirit. The apostles designate him as holy and also recognize him as the Spirit of truth and the Spirit of holiness, the fountain of verity and goodness. He is a person but he is a divine person. Now, my conclusions. The glories of his person are beyond doubt affirmed in Scripture. Now, they're often hid, granted, from full view. They can be withdrawn from many's observations because he is, after all, focusing on shedding light on Jesus, not on himself. But we can look at his works and there is amplitude and plenty of evidence to compensate for any seclusion of his visible majesty. The variety of his divine operations in even us exceed in glory, even if the brightness of his presence is concealed. To think that he gave me life is amazing enough. The ministration of the Spirit is therefore mighty, even if his voice is quiet. See, I'm soon beyond my depth when I think of the Holy Spirit. I do reverence him as I contemplate his person. I know who paid the debt on the cross. I know my Father in heaven. But I do appreciate the Holy Spirit. See, the waters rise as a river that cannot be passed over, Ezekiel 47, the Spirit. You can't master everything there is about the Spirit. But this much truth I know. The Holy Spirit is distinct from the Father and the Son. And that such personal properties are assigned to Him as demonstrate intelligent personality. That all those divine attributes such as self-existence from eternity, omnipotence, infinite wisdom, and foreknowledge, absolute freedom and goodness, creative, providential, and spiritual power, any one of those attributes would prove personal deity. The sad, tragic case is that no amount of proof ensures faith. The Lord said it himself to his disciples. I'm going to pray to the Father, and He's going to give you another comforter that He may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth Him not. Paul had a profound amount of integrity when he declared. Now we speak the things freely given to us of God, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teacheth. And we have to compare spiritual things with spiritual. Amen. See, that's a sobering reminder that the natural man receiveth not the things of God. Amen. Neither can he know 
because they are spiritually discerned. So I'm going to suggest, therefore, that we do have a high priest there that's touched with my infirmities, including my lack of understanding. And I want then to kneel at the throne of grace and I'm going to claim that prayer that he promised. He said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit that ask of him? Amen. That's just a good place to end. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we feel so blessed that we can rejoin in this fellowship of refreshing water and to meditate upon the glories of the Godhead, to meditate upon the great salvation in Jesus and the part that that Holy Spirit plays in it. And now, Heavenly Father, I pray that you will give me that spirit that I will be sensitive to his workings in my life. And I'm going to pledge this to you, Heavenly Father, and here's the reason I want it. That I, with open face, may behold as in a glass the glory of our Lord, that I might be 